Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser. Brought to you by public television stations. By Hanson Trust, a $10 billion transatlantic company with 23 consecutive years of growth in earnings and dividends by providing essential goods and services. By Prudential Beach Securities, the investment firm with rock solid resources that's leading the way to the future for investors. And by Primerica, the new name in financial services and specialty retailing, a company with the resources to fund growth for tomorrow, Primerica, a name to remember. Produced Friday, October 16. Our panelists are Mary Farrell, Lewis Holland, and Martin Zweig. Tonight's special guest is Alan Sinai, Chief Economist and Managing Director, Shearson Lehman Brothers. Good evening, I'm Louis Rukeyser. This is Wall Street Week. Welcome back. The stock market, we are told, is always delivering a message. The only trick is knowing how to read it. Well, this week, no great cleverness was required to catch the message coming from the stock market. That message was, help! <laughs> Last week, the Dow Jones Industrials had recorded their largest point loss in history, down nearly 159 points for the week. At the time, it seemed extremely unpleasant. In retrospect, though, it is beginning to look like a joyride. For this week, the Dow crashed more than 235 points and set a bundle of other nasty all-time records in the process. Just as a sampler to help make your weekend merry, Consider these nuggets. A week ago Tuesday, the Dow took its worst one-day point hit ever, more than 91 points. It managed to beat that twice this week, climaxing today with a 108-point mauling that occurred in the heaviest day of trading in the two centuries of the New York Stock Exchange, 338 million shares. Want more? How about this? All the broader market indexes also had record point declines today. The week's trading on the big board was itself a record. And as for that long-deferred correction, the Dow had not had so much as a 10% sell-off in more than three years. The index was off nearly that much this week alone and has now fallen 17.5% since its peak less than two months ago. Is it any wonder that a study this week reported that Americans' favorite color is blue. They must have done most of their polling in brokerage offices. But before we all turn the color of Smurfs, let's stop and consider what caused all this and where we go from here. First, let's round up the usual suspects. Interest rates are moving up, a development that hits stocks with a double whammy. Higher rates cut into corporate profits and deter expansion. In addition, they increase the attractiveness of investments that compete with stocks. With Treasury bonds tumbling another two points this week to their lowest levels in two years, the yields on all fixed income investments are on the rise. Second, jitters over new incidents in the Persian Gulf gave already nervous traders a fresh excuse to keep on selling. Third, the political situation was scarcely encouraging. Not only the concern over leadership in both parties, but a new tax increase package in the House Ways and Means Committee that would further penalize investment and savings. Nice going, guys. Fourth, Wall Street itself seemed in disarray. From scary layoffs at two major firms to growing evidence that the mindless, computer-driven program trading of the big institutions can turn worry into panic and prudent selling into wholesale desertion. Should we then act as hysterically as the computers? Or is this one of those many times in recent years when a little perspective and a little perseverance 
will eventually put the wise individual well ahead of the crowd. That's what we'll be investigating tonight with my panel and with one of the most respected economists in Wall Street. First, though, before we bring in first aid, let's count the wounded this past week in Wall Street. The Dow Jones Industrial Average made it 394 points down in two weeks. Taking flight early on when the trade deficit failed to narrow as much as expected, and then thoroughly ignoring, among other things, attempted reassurances about the economy from Treasury Secretary James Baker and Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan. The week's loss of more than 235 points to 2246.73 took the Dow below 2400, not to mention 2300, for the first time since June. The index hasn't been this low since May 22nd. And just take a look at these losses in the broader market indexes. Even our elves grew more despondent, taking their technical market index down two notches to a still neutral minus one. Do I have any consolation for you? Well, don't forget how high these averages are. Today's record point loss, for example, was on a percentage basis only number 76 on the all-time list of bad days for the Dow. Precious metals picked up a bit for the week, close to 10 bucks for gold and six cents for silver, but there was no great euphoria there either. Tonight, many commentators have been saying, to quote one on-air analyst, that the bull is dead. Marty Zweig is one who has been correctly worried about this market lately. Do you agree with that comment? Yes. Um but I haven't been looking for a bear market per se. I've been really in my own mind looking for a crash, but I didn't want to talk about it publicly because it's like shouting fire in a crowded theater and there's other ways to play it. You just tilt your strategy negatively and you shut your mouth. And I think we're in the middle of something reminiscent of 1946 or 1962, which were very similar, and to some extent 29, but it won't be as bad. And I think we're in the, oh, the middle to somewhat beyond the middle of this break. And uh, there'll be some violent rallies, though. In fact, probably early next week, I expect a violent rally. But that would not change your long-term estimate that the bull market's over? Well, I, I don't look for a long bear market here. I only look for a brief decline, but a vicious one. In 1962, the damage was done in two months. In 1929, it was done in, oh, mostly uh, 10 weeks. And I don't think it's going to drag on any longer than that here, but it just will go down more and then turn around. Some people say it's a bear market if you're off as much as 20 percent. We're nearly there now. What oh, you, yeah. What's your definition of a Well, bear it would be a bear market, but I think of a bear market 1973, 74, where it's drawn out for quite a while, whereas a crash is something like 46 or 62 that's over in, say, a month or two. Uh, that's, to me, the difference. How should people play it? Very cautiously. Um, I, you're going to be hurt no matter whether you're bullish or bearish. There's too many traps to fall into. We should have a selling climax and probably two of them. And after a selling climax, they always go back lower. So we're probably going to have, I'd say, three gigantic rallies within the next month or so, and, and every one of them could be a trap. Except the last one, <laughs> of course. But whenever that comes, you don't know. It's hard. Mary Farrell, Marty, in his affable way, has used that nasty word, crash. Do you accept that estimate? No, and I wouldn't accept the estimate that the bull market is over either. Certainly we're in a correction, and that's been more than obvious. And I think you have to remember here that we're not dealing with real buyers and real sellers making real buy and sell decisions like in the old stock market, because you do have this computerized program trading and this portfolio insurance really making these very extreme, very rapid decisions. May I ask you a question about that? Yes. These computers are used by large institutional investors whose money managers are paid huge sums of money to make no-brain decisions that are made for them by computers. Aren't these guys overpaid? <laughs> I don't think I want to answer yeah. that one. I Luke. think you just did. <laughs> Tell us why you don't think the bull market's over. Well, I think interest rates are the real key here. At these levels, we'd have to see some interest rate relief to see the bull market continue into a, another leg. And I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility. We could see some rate declines by next year, and that would certainly be a positive. At these levels, though, I would agree with Marty, we're in for some rough sledding, and, and the risk here really is that interest rates don't give you that relief, and then you would, you would continue with more of the same. Lou Holland, we have one extreme negative, one reassurance. How do you